How's it going guys? My name is Tavares and today we're putting my cheap Lamborghini back to stock. Okay, uh, not, not really, but sorta. So for those of you new to my channel, thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you guys like it. Subscribe if you like what you see. This hunk of metal behind me that's all taken apart is my 2008 Lamborghini Gallardo Spider. And I just put the manual transmission back in and now we have a working clutch, which was a really big deal because my clutch looked like this. Um. But today we're actually continuing all that work and we're putting everything back together. But before I do that, I want to show you guys something that's a little bit different on this car versus something more pedestrian like say a Camry or, or whatnot. And that has to do with the oil filter. Now doing an oil change on a regular car shouldn't be that big of a deal. On this car, it's a little bit more complex because this is a dry sump engine. And what that means is that instead of having a sump at the bottom with all the oil in it, like most cars have, they have an oil pan. This has a dry sump system, meaning that it's just actively uh, funneled from an oil tank right here, it's external. And what that does is that this engine can withstand a lot of G-force because as you can imagine, the G-forces in a regular engine, it would slosh all the oil to one side and sometimes the pickup in the oil pan doesn't get the amount of oil that it needs and then the engine doesn't get the amount of oil that it needs and then that's when things go kablooey. So in this engine, it has an oil pump that's constantly getting fed through an oil tank right here. And uh, that means that this can take a lot of G-force and a lot of high speed maneuvers without going bam. But there's a few little quirks and features, sorry, Doug DeMuro fans, about this engine when it comes to oil changes. And the main one has to do with the oil filter. Now the oil filter is this thing right here. And as you can see, it's not in the best position to take it out. It's actually in the V of the engine, which is great for oiling and it has really good access to all the, all the oiling necessary components. But in order to change it, it really is a pain in the butt. So you need one of these special oil filter removal tools made specifically for this car. And uh, this cost about 35 bucks, which is fine. But this filter, it's a cartridge style filter and that actually is really expensive because cartridge style filters, usually they cost the same amount as regular oil filters, maybe $10, $12 if you're getting something nice. This was almost $80. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a little bit more than I wanted to spend, but we need this car to run 100%. So another thing I noticed before I take this off, because I want to give you guys a little bit of a preamble because you guys might see some carnage right here is that this car sat for three years before it was given to me or I bought it. Um, and in that time, it was turned on sparingly. So when a car is only turned on and not reaching operating temperature, there's a lot of moisture that builds up in the crankcase. In addition, this car had a full tank of E85. That tank is, I still have it. I need to drain it and uh, I'll be doing that in a future episode. But that E85 also has a really, really high moisture content. And it wasn't helped by the fact that this car ran really, really rich because whoever put it together didn't really know what they were doing and some sensors got messed up and uh, the car was just running basically on limp mode. So it was throwing a lot of fuel into the cylinder. So uh, when I take this oil filter off, I'm expecting to see a lot of moisture, which looks sort of milkshakey. And and uh, that makes a lot of people scared that this has a blown head gasket, but there's no coolant in the oil. Uh, there's no oil in the coolant. And uh, this is all basically condensation from a pig rich E85 tune that's been sitting for three years and has been turned on just basically for five minutes at a time. So let's, let's see what that looks like. Now I have already drained the oil, so uh, there shouldn't be any oil uh, coming out the bottom, even though I have a drain plug in situ right now. But, uh, and I will be doing a flush of the oil system. But I just wanted to uh, make sure we had a fresh oil filter in there when we start uh, putting the oil back in the engine, because uh, this thing has most likely seen a lot better days. We wanna make sure that whatever o-rings are there that uh, we don't foul them because even though we're going to be replacing them it's better not to have fragments of stuff so that's actually not too bad yeah there we go so you can see there's this like milkshake substance 
and it does not smell like coolant at all. Um, that's, what, that's one of my major concerns that it smelled like coolant. And uh, a lot of times this, the sweet smell of uh, coolant mixing with uh, oil, it's, it spells death for an engine. And uh, I was a little bit worried about this, but um, yeah, I tur it turned out that it's just E85 and uh, that's what happens when cars just sit for a really long time. Let's see if we can get that to focus. There we go. Okay, so you can see right here, the cartridge, and there's more of that milky substance where the, uh, the gas and oil uh, just kind of met and met, met with uh, moisture. So uh, again, um, it's not that the gas is directly in the oil because that would indicate that there's a piston ring failure. But uh, I also do know that on engines that have uh, a lot of boost and a lot of power, they tend to gap the piston rings just a little bit more because when the boost hits and the more, more power, the uh, piston rings tend to close up uh, with, with more heat inside the cylinder. At least that's the theory. Now, uh, this engine might be toast. I don't think so. I really, really hope not. This engine sounded healthy and it didn't exhibit any uh, nasty smoke um, other than the smoke that comes from running rich. So I don't think I have to worry about that. But this is, uh, yeah, this, this is definitely seen better days and it is past it. So uh, I'm just gonna clean this up. And here is our new filter. And it is made in China of all places. And it is identical to the one we took out. So that's, uh, yep, that's the unit. So I'm just gonna slot this in, uh, put the new O-ring in because uh, there is an O-ring uh, here in the set. And I'm going to just clean this, this all up because it is a little bit dirty in there. Now, if anyone knows of a kit that would uh, remote mount the oil filter somewhere else, I'll be really interested in that. So I'm not sure if this is like an Audi thread or something like that but uh, I'd be really, really interested to see if they make a kit for an 08 Gallardo with a 5.0 and um, just maybe mount it somewhere else where it's a lot easier and maybe I can run a oil filter that isn't this specialized almost $100 piece. So uh, yeah, if you guys have any leads on that, let me know in the comments. So for those of you that are a little bit pedantic about this sort of stuff, I will be getting a Blackstone Labs oil analysis on this engine uh, when I get a few miles on it and uh, when I make sure that it's only been run uh, up to operating temperature and it doesn't have this, uh, this sort of stuff in it. I mean, if I still run it and it has this um, milkshakey substance, then I definitely will stop what I'm doing and basically do an engine rebuild. But I think this is really nothing to worry about. Uh, those who have E85 uh, cars and they store them for the winter and they only turn them on for like five or 10 minutes, you guys will know this stuff uh, pretty well. So I put this back. Yeah, it should be, should be good, locked in there. And all the O-rings are where they should be. Leave the old O-ring, yep, right here. And all I have to do is put this back where it came. Since I already drained the old oil, then that means our oil change is essentially complete, even though some old oil is gonna come out of that drain plug when I uh, take off the drain plug to plumb the turbos. That's another thing about these engines. Um, in a regular engine, regular wet sump engine, uh, you'd have to plumb the turbos, the turbo drain line, into some place above the oil level on the pan. Here, you have to put it into the drain plug itself because there's actually suction coming up from the drain plug uh, because that's where the uh, oil pump gets the oil from. It's, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty ingenious. Uh, I, I always thought that was wrong, but apparently a lot of people have been running it like this and it makes a lot of sense. So uh, I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel on that. And I'm gonna run what I brung. So the next thing I wanna concentrate on are these transmission bolts. Now, the only thing holding my transmission onto the engine at this point is this one bolt. And uh, it's a little trooper, uh, if I'm honest. But um, yeah, I only put this on uh, just to test that the transmission was um, uh, not fouling on anything and uh, that it was flush with the engine, which it is, and our clutch works as intended. So now I'm just going to do up all the other bolts. Now, uh, not, not bolts, they're nuts, but a lot of people think that you need, it's absolutely imperative that you uh, tighten these down to spec, meaning that you use a torque wrench and uh, all that other stuff. I generally don't think so. Uh, I think that the method of uh, guten tight is, uh, is pretty good for, uh, for stuff like this. 
because they don't have a ton of uh, force going in either direction. This is just uh, to keep everything in one sort of plane. So, uh, and the fact that there are multiple bolts, meaning that if you do it hand tight uh, and you know give it a little bit of oomph, I think that'll be fine. I don't think that you really need a torque wrench on here, even though some people in the comments will likely disagree. Uh, I don't really think it's a, it's a big deal. Also add to the fact that you can't actually get a torque wrench in a lot of these places. Uh, this bolt specifically, you can't get a socket on there. You have to use a open-ended and uh, with an open-ended, you can't really exert that much torque. So uh, yeah, again, uh, good and tight is good enough. Now the next thing I wanna focus on are these valve covers. Now some of you may have seen when I took these valve covers off and basically gave them a lick of bed liner uh, to give that crinkle finish and uh, they look really, really good. However, I never actually tightened them down all the way. And I thought I would give you guys a little bit of insight when you're doing valve covers on your car because it can be a little bit tricky to put valve covers on and making sure that they don't leak. So since there's about a dozen bolts or so, I think there's like 14 bolts uh, on my valve cover, I'm actually gonna do a crisscross pattern starting from the outside to the in. Now, sometimes people start from the inside to the out and uh, I don't actually have a factory service manual for this car, so I'm not sure uh, what the bolt pattern is, but good enough is sort of good enough in this instance. However, what you do wanna do is you wanna make sure that these bolts are torqued to spec because they have a thin gasket that sits between this and the engine. And uh, if that gasket fails or it's pinched in some way or it's just loose, then oil gets on the hot exhaust manifold and then that's where you get a lot of burning and maybe even a fire. So uh, you definitely wanna do these up. On a lot of instances, on a lot of other cars, you're gonna wanna put some RTV around some of these ceiling surfaces. But on this car, it's all one flat edge, so it should be okay. And uh, I made sure to clean everything before I put this valve cover back. So I'm just gonna do up a uh, cross pattern, and it's actually in inch pounds that I have to torque this. So it's 89 inch pounds, which translates to around 7.4 foot pounds. And uh, that's what we're gonna do, hopefully, my uh, Harbor Freight torque wrench is good enough for that. I think it is. I don't think it's gonna make any difference uh, one way or the other, but I've been rambling, let's get to work. Okay, so now that that's done, I wanted to show you guys something that I bought, and it's actually a brand new part from Lamborghini. So uh, you can see this cool original spare parts. Look at that, that's uh, pretty cool. Comes in this cool Lamborghini wrapping paper uh, that is probably way more expensive than regular wrapping paper. But uh, these are the spark plug covers, and they're metal, and you can see that they go right here on the spark plug, um, on the uh, ignition coil packs rather. The reason why I'm not putting them on now is because this engine doesn't have any spark plugs in them. Uh, I have ordered some new spark plugs because I don't know how old these are, but uh, they definitely look like, you know, they've seen a few few launches um, and they're coppers. Maybe I can get some uh, something uh, platinum so they have a little bit more longevity, uh, but I have to make sure that they are the right heat range because uh, with boost, you wanna have, with Boost, you wanna make sure that uh, you have the correct heat range. And uh, they usually go one or two steps colder depending on how much boost you go. So I think these are NGK BKR7Es. And um, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, these are one step colder copper plugs. And I think I used them on a Nissan Maxima, but uh, I could be mistaken there. Uh, but I'll have to order 10 new ones of these. They're, they're pretty cheap, especially considering the engine is going on. Uh, but then we can put these nice, cool babies on. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do this up in um, the bed liner. I could, but 
Yeah, we'll see. So actually, let's take the other valve cover as a given. And I want to show you guys something kind of, dare I say, cool. All right, so we're back behind the car and uh, I have bolted on this subframe-ish section thing that uh, basically connects the two um, strut towers here, one right here and one right there. Uh, just make sure that the body doesn't flex. Uh, so this is actually an integral structural piece, but it seems like somebody has basically bolted one of these on. And uh, if you don't know what this is, this is a expansion tank. Uh, this is for the cooling system and it basically, uh, well, this is exactly how you know how much coolant you have uh, by, there's a level somewhere over here. Looks kind of like the Death Star. This is not a Lamborghini part. And in fact, this is actually a part from a Jetta, a Volkswagen Jetta. I have no idea how it got on this car, but I think it's just one of those things where since they put in the twin turbo system and the air to water intercooler was just taking up all this space and the coolant tank would usually sit back here, they had to think outside the box, but this looks really cheap. It looks really low rent. And I have no idea how good it is because it's like melted on the side, it's singed. And this is really cheap plastic in any case. So what I did is I got an OEM Lamborghini coolant tank. And um, actually it's, it's not OEM Lamborghini. Uh, Volkswagen and Audi also use this in their car. So I believe this is from an Audi A8 and it cost me about 45 bucks and then a few more bucks for the cap. This is brand new, so I don't have to worry about it, but I have actually no idea how to mount it because uh, the weird mounting provisions here, um, I don't know how I can bolt it on, but I have seen twin turbo kits on spiders with this uh, somewhere around this vicinity. So I think I have to make a bracket, something like that, or I can hide it a little bit like this. So the entire engine up to about here is gonna be covered up. So I wanna make this as accessible as possible. Uh, the stock positioning was like right in the back where it's really hard to tell how much coolant you have. Uh, yeah, it basically makes it impossible because the coolant, um, the way you tell is by looking down here and you have to look basically completely in that hole and uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. So I wanna make it accessible and, um, but I'm not sure how to do it. So I think I'm gonna need your help again. If you know of any twin turbo kits that uh, have the stock uh, coolant expansion tank, can you let me know how they mounted it? I have no problem making brackets, but um, I need to know how everything everything around it is gonna mount on because I don't want to uh, make a bracket and then have it basically foul on everything else because stuff gets really tight when, I, when you start putting intakes and, uh, and the covers and all that stuff. So I wanna make sure that there's enough room for everything. So uh, that we'll leave for next time. I just wanted to show you that uh, apparently at some point in this car's past, they use Volkswagen Jetta parts and uh, we're definitely gonna throw this away. So guys, that's actually gonna be it for today. Uh, I know this might've been a shorter episode where we don't get that much done, but actually we, we, we got a decent amount done. We had all the bolts on the transmission done. We got all the lines ran. We got the shifter linkage in. Uh, we got the bolts tightened on the valve cover. We have the uh, frame mounted and uh, we sort of diagnosed this coolant issue somewhat. Uh, so I think that's, that's a pretty good day. I want you guys to stay tuned for the next episode where I'm actually not gonna be working on this car per se, but I'm gonna make sure that I have every skill I need to make sure that when this car does run, I'll be ready for it. Now, I don't wanna be cryptic here. I'm actually going to the Michelin Pilot Experience that's in Sebring. And uh, basically I'm going to drive on the tires that I put on this car, the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's. And uh, I'm gonna be driving all sorts of uh, high horsepower cars, S something analog to this. And uh, I've actually never driven a really high horsepower car on a track. And uh, I've never driven with tires like this in anger. So I'm really interested in knowing how they handle and how I can make myself better because I don't want the first time I'm out with this car and I hit it, I don't wanna go off into a tree. So stay tuned for that. That's gonna be coming up on Monday. But after that, we're actually going full whole hog on this. Do people, 
people even say that anymore? We're gonna be redoing the fuel system. Uh, I already have a supplier for all the AN lines, the, uh, the lines for the fuel, the coolant, all that stuff. We're gonna be mounting the radiator, the heat exchanger, from the back where it lived and didn't actually exchange any heat to the front. So we're gonna be taking apart the front and uh, you guys get to see all of that. Uh, then we are going to be doing a DIY turbo system and redoing the entire turbo kit that came on this car, kit, because it really wasn't a kit, it was a custom job and they got a lot of stuff wrong. Uh, but this is getting a completely revamped turbo system and this is gonna make a ton of power if I get it right. But if you'd like to contact me, you can do so at The Real Tavares, that is Instagram and Twitter, uh, facebook.com slash asktavares and asktavares at gmail.com is my email. You guys have been really good at sending me emails and, and tips and tricks and stuff and I would appreciate some help, uh, especially on the solution of how to mount this and uh, some other part numbers. I believe I asked you in the previous episode, I need the, uh, the part for the little rubber grommet uh, for the transmission. Uh, there's a hole in my transmission and I don't want water getting in there. So you can let me know uh, how all, that all goes and what part numbers and what to order. Uh, thank you very much for anybody giving me this information or you just want to talk. I'm, perfectly fine with that as well. If you'd like to order one of these shirts and tell everybody that you are the warranty, then link will be in the description below. You can also watch my daily podcast, the Wrench Everyday Podcast that I have every day with Andrew Howell, really, really good friend of mine. And uh, you can see that down below on the Wrench Everyday channel. But until next time, this is me telling you that on cars like this that are really close to coming together and running and well, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. You guys need to wrench every day.